Massachusetts shelters are now almost at capacity. And Governor Maura Healy says migrants coming into the state and families that are already here and are unhoused will have to wait until temporary housing spots open up. The group Lawyers for Civil Rights sued over the change, arguing the move violates the state's right to shelter law. But this week, a state judge disagreed. And now the Healy administration can go ahead with this new shelter cap. It's a move Healy first announced a few weeks back when she also urged the federal government to do more to take the pressure off states like this one. We need urgent support from the federal government, which bears ultimate responsibility for this situation. GBH News State House reporter Katie Lannon and Politico's Lisa Kaczynski join me now to discuss. Good to see you both. Thanks for being here. So, Katie, when I first heard that the Healy administration was basically saying we can't follow this law that's on the books because we don't have sufficient resources, my instinctive reaction was, well, that doesn't make sense. They'll clearly just need to free up the resources so that they can follow the law that is on the books. But a state judge has disagreed. What's the judge's rationale for saying, no, we don't need to follow this right now? Yeah, I think the you know what the judge has been saying, and it is in line with what the Healy administration is arguing, is that you you can't follow the law when the money's not there. Mm-hmm. They can only do it up until a point when you know reality essentially sets in, and you know that's not as uncommon a thing as you might expect. Um, there's the the phrase that it all hinges on, a bit of Beacon Hill jargon, subject to appropriation, yeah. which essentially means. Yeah, when we can pay for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something, you know, that people who tend to criticize the legislature almost see that as an escape clause. That was one of the arguments that yeah. critics of the uh, millionaire's tax raised, that there was a line in there subject to appropriation. You know, as long as the legislature puts this money towards education and transportation, we have to spend it on education and transportation. We've seen right. in, uh, without going down too much of a, you know, budgetary rabbit hole, you see this come up a lot in education funding where regional school transportation under state law, mm. the state's supposed to fully pick up those costs. But, you know, and while they've increased it every year, I think we're up in maybe 90% reimbursement now, that's not being fully funded either. So it is something that comes up from time to time. I'm really glad that, that you ran through that because while I now remember the examples that you talked about, I'd completely forgotten them in this particular case when it started developing. So a month and a half ago, the governor asked the legislature for $250 million extra for the system. Mm-hmm. Why haven't they acted? So that is part of a broader supplemental budget, a, a routine mm-hmm. spending bill that House and Senate lawmakers are still negotiating over um, and haven't brought any of that to the floor yet. We don't know what the like overall holdup is. We do know on the migrant shelter and shelter funding, I should say, in particular, that uh, top Democrats, particularly House Speaker Ron Mariano, have questions about what the eventual total cost is going to be, about how much money they are going to have to put behind this. And he, he's really, it seems like, still looking for some more information from the administration before uh, granting that request in full or in part. Lisa Kaczynski, as of, I believe, right now, as we talk, the state has not quite hit that 7,500 family mark. We're very close. Maybe we'll hit it over the weekend. Uh, When we do reach that point, whenever it happens, if you're a family that needs shelter, uh, what are the new processes that have been put in place by the Healy administration that you're going to have to work through? So there's kind of two parts to this. One is when the shelter system, which was hovering around 7,400 families, gets to 7,500 families, there's a wait list that goes into effect, which basically the state is going to hand families a flyer that says, we can't shelter you tonight. That's actually what the flyer that that we've seen says. I saw it when I linked, or because you linked to it in the Politico newsletter. Yep. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so... There are three options in that flyer, which is basically return to the last safe place that you stayed, apply for a program where the state will help you pay rent but will not help you find an apartment, Mm -hmm. or apply for other services um, like food stamps. But it doesn't actually tell families where to go that night, which is raising concerns that they may go to emergency rooms, to police stations. There is just no shelter capacity um, right now, though uh, other forms of shelter are starting to try and scale up for this and for the winter. What has already gone into effect is this new intake system for families that are entering the system now, which basically includes a a clinical and safety risk assessment where they 
look at families' medical conditions if they are in, you know, effectively in harm's way from a domestic violence situation mm -hmm. or something else. And there are four tiers of priority, um, which will eventually factor into that wait list that they're now being assessed on. Has the governor or her administration committed to making people move out after a year? Is that something that's being discussed but hasn't been locked in? There is now discussion of a time limit. They built in two regulations that were filed this week with 30 days notice um, being able to tell a family to leave. We've seen this already starting to happen in New York City, another you know place that is also dealing with a huge influx of migrants and homeless families. So the governor said this week that she is you know considering this. She's kind of in all options on the table, um, governor and mm -hmm. particularly in this situation, but it's not something that they've moved forward with yet. It is on the table, though, because we have been seeing families stay in what's supposed to be a temporary shelter system for upwards of a year. And we should probably note here, I should probably note, and I believe I learned this from your coverage of, <laughs> of this issue playing out on Beacon Hill, the governor has created two new programs that are aimed at getting migrants in particular training for jobs and then connecting them with jobs, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. She has a, a skill building program for people who don't uh, currently have legal authorization to work in the U.S., people from other countries, and a program that will connect people um, who are authorized to work with jobs uh, from local employers who have, you know, a need. We hear all the time about workforce shortages. On top of that, the Biden administration is going to be uh, up in Middlesex County later this month to set up a clinic helping process work authorizations for migrants uh, staying in Massachusetts shelters to hopefully speed things along a bit. Of course, the governor, uh, members of Congress, state elected officials as well, state lawmakers, have really been pushing for the Biden administration to speed up this work authorization process. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you, is that clinic that's going to be taking place uh, in Middlesex County, it, is it a clinic that will try to help people work through the process while maintaining the existing parameters of the process? There's no accelerated timetable. I think it's, I think it's going to be a, a more efficient way of getting it done. There, there have been some kind of internal things that the Biden administration has done to kind of work towards getting it, getting it all to move a little bit faster. So we're, we're really, I think, going to see what ultimately comes out of that clinic. I want to ask you both. The legislature tends to move, as we've talked about here repeatedly, very, very slowly, very deliberately. But state officials say that there's going to be, by June of next year, 13,000 families, which is kind of daunting to contemplate. If we, you know, we're about to hit 7,500, that's a whole lot more. Do you think that that impending surge, if the current rate of people coming in continues, uh, is that going to make the legislature operate with a little more dispatch than they usually do or not? Uh, I'll ask you first, and then I'd like to get Lisa's take. Yeah, I think we, we've seen the legislature certainly knows uh, that this is a, a situation that's rapidly uh, becoming more serious, uh, as it has been. Um, you know, former Governor Charlie Baker was kind of sounding the alarms about this when he was still in office. And one thing we've seen interestingly this week from House Speaker Mariano is that he, he put out a statement saying basically, like, we don't intend to change the right to shelter law. Anything that would happen there would have to be by executive order. It's kind of on the governor to make any changes there. As far mm -hmm. as what they might do in terms of funding, in terms of other resources and efforts to, to help the people who are here, who are in need of shelter, I, I don't know what we're going to end up seeing. I think one thing, before you answer, I, I remember reading, and I think it was in your newsletter, although it might have been a piece that Katie wrote, Aaron Michael was the House Ways and Means Chair, talking about the uncertainty around this that is sort of preceding any legislative action. One of the things he mentioned at the time was the court case, yeah. which has now been resolved. Uh, what's your sense of how quickly the legislature might move and whether they might move a little faster than usual? So uh, the House Ways and Means Chair did say, um, you know, as these things start to resolve, the court case, I talked to him just before uh, that uh, decision came down, that we could expect to see something soon, but that would again only be on some version of that $250 million request that Katie had mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And that really is just kind of there as, as to kind of prop up the system. That's not going to help in the longer term. And right now, the $325 million that the state had budgeted to last 
through the end of the next, you know, the end of the fiscal year in next June, that's projected to run out in large form in January. So that 250 million isn't going to float them till the end of the year either. So there's a much, there's the short term question of funding, which I do believe could potentially move, I'm not going to say it will, before yeah. formal sessions end for the year on November 15th. But there's a much longer term question when they come back in January that remains to be seen how they're going to address it. You and your Mass Playbook colleague, Kelly Garrity, noted that the Mass Fiscal Alliance, the conservative group that likes to go uh, and critique Democratic politicians, is running ads right now, hitting Healy for her handling of this situation. Do you believe that there is a legitimate political risk here for the governor? It might sound callous to talk about political risk when we're dealing with human misery, but do you think that there's a political price you might pay? We do have to talk about it because this is something that has taken over, really just consumed a lot of the back half of her first year in office. There have been some, there has been some polling on the situation so far, um, both with housing, the housing shortage in the state, which is contributing to, um, you know, the burden on the shelter system, mm -hmm. and also on the migrant surge, um, particularly, that shows some warning signs for the governor. Um, she's not necessarily getting completely dinged, for lack of better word, on it yet. She still has a solid approval rating, um, you know, in the 50s, which is good for a new governor. But the polling basically shows that there are warning signs that if something doesn't change in the situation or it continues to escalate, these are things that voters could look at and say, she's not doing a good enough job handling it. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie, a couple months ago, we saw some legislators openly criticizing the governor's handling of this situation. I think State Rep Mike Moran was one of them talking about a lack of transparency, uh, not enough communication they were claiming. Is that something that has continued to simmer or has it petered out? Yeah, after those initial critiques, you did see kind of the, the Healy administration make an effort to bring lawmakers more into the conversation. We do still hear the kind of, we need more answers drumbeat from some uh, in the legislature. We also hear uh, some lawmakers who are more on the left, like Rep Marjorie Decker of Cambridge was at a rally this week um, calling for Governor Healy to pause the, the cap, the shelter cap, and for the legislature to put more funding into the shelter system. We also hear, you know, Republican legislators continue to critique the right to shelter law in particular. Um, and actually, one interesting litmus test of those political consequences uh, might be seen in a special election coming up next week for an open state Senate seat. The Republican candidate in that race, Representative Peter Durant, sees the migrants and shelter situation as a real pressing issue. I get his emails been, every day, as I expect you yeah, do. Yeah, he's new, been yep. pretty outspoken on that, and he's running against a, a Democratic lawmaker who hasn't been as vocal on the issue. Who's that Democrat again? Uh, Rep. Jonathan Zlotnick of Gardner. So that's uh, something to watch on Central Mass. It's obviously not the only issue at play in the race, but, you know, there's always tea leaves to read in an election. Yeah, yeah, and that's the sort of one that those of us in the media, myself in particular, would love to make a great deal of meaning out of after the fact. So that'll be interesting. You have a, a new piece about that race, right? That's right, kind of breaking down the competitive nature of that district. GPHnews.org. Okay, Katie Lannon and Lisa Kaczynski, thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. for having us.